You'll be familiar with the feeling. It's the one that comes over you on a sunny late spring day about three weeks before summer vacation. You're sitting in class at your desk just like all the other students, staring out the window dreaming of baseball or horses or swimming or just being anywhere but here in this classroom. Really, you're about half asleep in the warm, slow-moving air and not really paying attention to what the teacher is saying. Whatever they're saying barely seems to matter. They just keep droning on and on, occasionally mentioning a name or a date that doesn't really seem any more important to them than it does to you. All they want to do is get through the material. All you want to do is get through the day. You're all, you, the teacher, and the rest of the students, here doing time, trying to survive another history lesson, hoping any little bit of it will stick in your head until it's time to take the test. That's all anyone wants. And it's barely going to work, because when you're in school, some sort of history class is mandatory. Some level of basic fact is necessary, we're told, for reasons. And if you ask what those reasons are, the instructor will usually quote someone they think once said, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. As if that was accurate, or even what they were talking about in the first place, and as if that was reason enough to know what day your country's constitution was signed, or who wrote your national anthem, or when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. The problem is, that's not why you need to know a bit of history. That's just reciting facts. Facts with no context, mostly. Facts that are expected to be recited verbatim not because they make you a better person, but because they will appear on a test. And they'll appear on that test not because you've been made to understand their importance in the entire string of events that led up to the occurrence of that fact, but because someone, somewhere, decided that in order to prove you had been through some sort of educational system, these were the facts you needed to be taught in order to receive the piece of paper that says you've been through the educational system. And good luck taking an interest in that as a student or a teacher. Now, it is true that some teachers at whatever educational level you happen to be at can make history fun and exciting and keep you interested and provide context and relevance that makes the whole thing come alive and helps you to understand that the world you live in is a product of the world of the past. You may even be one such teacher yourself. But it is also equally true that the vast majority of teachers were just like you in school when history class rolled around, and you certainly wouldn't want to take a history class from yourself, now would you? If you are a very lucky student, you do one of two things. Either you run into a teacher who gets you interested in the subject, or you develop an interest in history yourself in some way. Maybe you accidentally read a book or saw a movie or watched a TV program that made some bit of history sound interesting, and so you looked it up and discovered some actually interesting stuff. Or maybe you, like we did, and secretly we suspect many of you took this latter path, you played a game that had elements of historical information in it and that made you want to find out a bit more. You know, like... Dungeons and Dragons in its pseudo-medieval historical setting. A setting we can call pseudo-medieval because we took an interest, looked up various parts of it, and discovered which bits were accurate and which bits weren't. Now, of course, our view of history is completely different. We found our own reasons to continue studying history. We put history together in interesting ways in order to explain why things are the way they are and how they got to be that way. And while there are many, many boring parts of history where not much happened, there are also extremely interesting bits where everything seems to be happening at once. Except you'll discover there aren't really any boring bits of history after all. The ones you think are the boring bits 
are really the parts where all the exciting bits are hard at work doing their thing and getting ready to spawn even more exciting bits. Even April 11th, 1954 turns out to be interesting if you look at it right, sandwiched as it is between an air disaster and the recording of Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley in the comments. The point is, though, not to convince you to take a greater interest in history. We can't make you like history. You have to do that yourself. In fact, we presume, if you listen to this show regularly, that you have a sufficient interest in history already. Rather, in this episode, we want to take a look at where all this history came from and why it went from being largely ignored for so much of actual history to suddenly mattering a great deal. What, in fact, is the history of history? This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Okay, this is going to sound really obvious, but history is the study of the past. One more time, because we're nearly certain you missed the important word in that sentence. History is the study of the past. Let's try it a different way. The recitation of names, dates, and locations is not history. They're just particular people in a particular place at a particular time. They are free-floating nuggets of information that, without context and explanation and study, tell you nothing about what actually happened to those people in that place at that time and why it happened. For example, if we tell you the Great Fire of Rome occurred on the night of July 19th, 64 CE, that's all well and good. You can write that down, maybe even memorize it, and whenever someone or a piece of paper asks you when the Great Fire of Rome was, you can immediately pop up and say the night of July 19th, 64 CE, and be correct. Congratulations, you've memorized a tiny piece of information, a fact. However, you have no more learned anything about history than you did learning the order of the alphabet. Instead, to study history, it helps to know why Rome burned, and why the Great Fire of Rome was called the Great Fire of Rome, and not, for instance, the seventh really big fire in Rome, which it was. You might ask why anyone didn't work harder to put it out, only to learn they did, but it took six days. And then it reignited and burned for a further three days. And then you'll think about Nero and his fiddle, and whether that was really true, and possibly you might recall that Nero was said to have blamed the Christians for the fire and turned it to his political advantage. But then you might also find out that that part of the story is disputed and maybe didn't happen quite like that. Along the way, you'll probably find out about the Roman fire brigade and the state of repair of the aqueducts and how the streets of Rome were crowded and all the buildings too close together and how people were reduced to fighting the fire with buckets of water and blankets and vinegar and how maybe it was all done on purpose just so Nero could build a new palace. And then your collection of information is beginning to be big enough to see the context of the event and what it meant, and why it was such a big deal that it got reduced to the false phrase, Nero fiddled while Rome burned. And if you go listen to our episode entitled Circus, you'll get even more context about the Great Fire of Rome, which occurred on the night of July 19th, 64 CE, but was really the culmination of a series of events, political motivations, personal desires, and complicated interweaving of circumstances that made it almost inevitable that at some point over 70% of Rome would burn to the ground and about which almost nothing you learned in school is actually all that true. History is the study of the past. In fact, the word history itself comes from the Greek historia, which means inquiry or knowledge acquired by investigation, and you might think that's leaving it a bit late to come up with a name for something that was happening well before the Greeks came on the scene, but here's the thing, prior to the Greeks, history wasn't a thing. 
there wasn't a thing there to name. That is to say, there was a lot of history, but no one was really studying it. The reason for this is twofold. The first one can probably best be illustrated by asking the question, who invented the wheel? If you happen to know, please do write in. But as far as anyone can tell, the name of the inventor of the wheel has been lost to history. As in, history has no way of discovering it. Even where and when the wheel was invented are a bit shaky. Generally, Mesopotamia gets the credit, but there's little enough evidence to back it up. And as for when? Sometime in the late Neolithic. Probably. Technically speaking, though, the name of the inventor belongs to a period called prehistory, which is defined as that portion of history which falls outside the invention of writing and consequently writing things down. The inventor of the wheel didn't write their name down. No one wrote it down for them, and certainly even if they had, it didn't survive to be discovered by anyone who subsequently went on to write it down again. Whole swaths of the early human timeline are gone, and the best we can do about most of them is make some educated guesses based on recovered artifacts and remains, which is the province of the archaeologist and the anthropologist. It's worth noting that, in general, the prehistory period of a given culture is deemed to have started with the first use of stone tools, which is often called the Paleolithic or Old Stone Age. When the culture develops a system of writing and can write about itself, prehistory ends and proper history can begin. What makes that interesting is that it means some civilizations and cultures have only entered the realm of history relatively recently, some as late as the 19th century, some even more recently. New Guinea, for instance, didn't properly leave prehistory until the 1900s. The normal course of events is that once a given culture or society has left prehistory, those cultures that surround it are generally not far behind as the system of writing is picked up and developed by each of their neighbors. However, there is some lag time in which a culture cannot write about itself, but may be written about by others. This is called that culture's proto-history, and it's useful to remember that in order for a culture's history to be a proper full-fledged history of that culture, it must be written by the culture itself. It's no good calling your neighbors savage barbarians without asking them what the name on their certificate says. It won't stick. The second reason no one had really studied history before the Greeks did was because a lot of the history that was written down wasn't really history either. What it was instead was a lot of folklore, mythology, legend, and family stories. There might, for example, be a story in your family about the time great-great-grandfather Harry fought in the war against the Upper Outer Lower Slobovians and single-handedly stormed their fortress and captured the prince. But that wasn't any better than a story about how Trog the Truculent came up from the Holy Swamp and, in a fit of pique, made a mud ball from which all your people were formed. Both those stories represent a portion of what is called cultural heritage. All of a culture's cultural heritage is important, of course, and truthfully the term cultural heritage covers a lot more than what we're using it for here. Things like architecture, traditions, even the sorts of landscapes the culture typically lived and worked in. But the reason folklore, myths, legends, and family stories fall into the cultural heritage category and not under the heading of history is because no external sources support them. Great-great-grandfather Harry sure sounds amazing, and maybe he does have a bit of rock he says is from the very road he walked down to get to the fortress as proof of his adventure, and sure, that's a lovely creation myth with many interesting things to say about why the tribe lives so much of its life near the swamp being stung by giant mosquitoes when they could have moved a few hundred yards inland and avoided them altogether... But unless another bunch of people have a note in their histories that says, and then we all saw some horrid swamp monster come out of the swamps. Boy, was it grumpy. And get this, it made a ball of stinking mud and then shaped it into people who came to life and set up camp right in the middle of the giant mosquitoes. And that's why we don't let our children play anywhere near the swamps. You'll have a hard time convincing people that your stories are anything other than folklore and mythology. And even then, you're going to need more than one source. Incredible ones, too. 
Unfortunately, until the Greeks really got to poking around, that's all most of so-called history was back then. A load of cultural heritage without much actual proof behind it. Even the Greeks' own history was a bit suspect. So much of everything was just stories without any way to verify and evaluate them that it wasn't really possible to build up a coherent and accurate picture of what went on before a fellow named Herodotus came along. Now, before we get much further, let us preface things by saying, sure, there might have been others before Herodotus who attempted to do what Herodotus did. Some might even have done so successfully. But the reason Herodotus gets the credit for it all is because of one simple fact. His work survived, whereas everyone else's work prior to his did not. There are names out there in various other works of other people who it was said did the same sort of thing, but nothing they were said to have written lasted long enough to be examined and evaluated by anything like a modern scholar. So Herodotus gets the nod. Herodotus was born a Persian in Persia sometime around 485 BCE in a place called Helicarnassus in what is now modern-day Turkey. And for someone who is going to be called the father of history, very little is actually known about him. There are basically two sources, Herodotus himself, who didn't talk about himself and his surviving works all that much, and an encyclopedia written over a thousand years later by the Byzantines called the Suda, which, while encyclopedic in nature, was more of a sort of book of grammar than anything else. In any case, between those two sources lays all our knowledge of Herodotus. Herodotus had a brother named Theodorus and was somehow related to the epic poet Paniasus. The family moved around a lot when Herodotus was a child, probably for political reasons, most likely because of a failed uprising against the local tyrant. They spent time on the island of Samos and seemed to enjoy it there. The Suda then goes on to relate a story about how Herodotus grew up and returned home to Halicarnassus to lead another revolt against the tyrant, this time successfully. But there's no reason to suspect this is true and not just a bit of poetic license by the Byzantines to make him slightly more exciting. Either that, or it was a feeble attempt to explain why Herodotus wrote like an Ionian instead of a Dorian. Ionian being the dialect used around Samos. However, it was later shown that it was perfectly normal to write official documents in the Ionian dialect in and around Halicarnassus, so no additional heroic explanation was needed. During Herodotus' time, Halicarnassus was an important Persian port with connections throughout the known world, particularly in Greece and Egypt. Thanks to all these international connections, Herodotus was himself well-connected, and so traveled through places like Egypt, Tyre, and Babylon, and then ended up, possibly because of more political trouble, taking up residence in Athens sometime around 447 BCE. Part of his attraction to Athens was that he admired the people and their democratic institutions. As someone who had previously lived under a tyrant, the advantages of democracy must have been manifold and impressive. But what of Herodotus's claim to fame? In 430 BCE, Herodotus sat down and wrote the work for which he is famous, the histories. Not all at once, probably. It's a pretty safe bet he was working on it on and off for several years previously. Regardless, in 430 BCE, the histories was published, and right in the beginning, he explains why he's written it. Here are presented the results of the inquiry carried out by Herodotus of Halicarnassus. The purpose is to prevent the traces of human events from being erased by time, and to preserve the fame of the important and remarkable achievements produced by both Greeks and non-Greeks. Among the matters covered is, in particular, the cause of the hostilities between Greeks and non-Greeks. Yep, basically the nine books of the histories are all about explaining why the Greeks just can't get along with their neighbors. Particularly, it has to be said, the Persians, which we'll come back to in a bit. It's hard to express just how radical Herodotus' approach to writing the histories was, 
Instead of just relying on word of mouth and stories he may have heard around Athens about how things happened, he actually went to look at the many places and objects involved and to hear from as many of the peoples involved as he could to get their own stories and build up a collection of information about his subjects. And then he wrote them down and did the other thing that hardly any other writer about past events had done. He compared them. He didn't just take at face value the story of how so-and-so attacked such-and-such a place. Instead, he found other stories of so-and-so and and the attack on such-and-such, as many as he could, and then he brought them all together and compared them to each other, looking for the bits that they agreed on most. If 10 of 15 stories said that so-and-so attacked on Tuesday, three claimed a Wednesday, and two said, no, no, it was a Friday, Herodotus took it to mean that the day of attack was most likely a Tuesday and wrote that down. Suddenly, history wasn't just about collecting the most interesting stories, true or not. It was about trying to make sense of all the stories about a thing and then presenting a new narrative that gave as many of the agreed-upon facts as possible. And throughout it all, Herodotus was trying to explain why. Why can't the Greeks get along with their neighbors? Why are they at war with almost everyone around them? He attempts to explore the fundamental causes of each and every conflict the Greeks of the time had. And incredibly, he starts with the Trojan War and lays the blame for that squarely on the shoulders of Zeus and Jason of Jason and the Argonauts fame. See, Zeus either seduced or raped first Io and then Europa. And Jason, well, Jason, he made promises to Medea in order to gain the Golden Fleece, promises which he at first kept, but then, when he spotted another girl he liked better, he tossed Medea and their possibly 14 children out on their ear. And in order not to get too tangled up in stories we don't have time for, we'll just say that a guy named Paris was pretty affected by all this And that made him run off and elope with Helen of Troy, which kicked off the entire Trojan War, an event which was, in Herodotus' view, a precursor event for every other conflict to follow between the people of Europe and the people of Asia. You can see that not everything in the histories was going to be entirely above board and factual, but to a certain extent there was no way around this. Records of any sort just sort of ran out once you got back far enough, as we mentioned earlier. But Herodotus was the first person on record to even make the attempt to make all that had gone before make sense by doing the research, comparing the evidence, and crafting a new narrative that explained things as best he could. And that is what history really is. Pretty much everyone knows that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, though most probably don't recall the rest of the poem that line belongs to. But that's just the recitation of a fact. You wouldn't say 2 plus 2 equals 4 and then claim you understood math. That's just a tiny, tiny piece of information that, without the larger context of mathematics to help you understand why putting two objects together with two other objects makes four objects, is useless and makes no sense. Sure, Columbus sailed in 1492, but without all the rest of history to go around that fact and explain why Columbus was sailing, what he hoped to accomplish, and why it mattered so much, you're left with no better understanding of it than when you started. It was Herodotus that showed the world that history had a narrative that could be traced and proven that one thing caused another, and if you were going to try and understand the present, you had to understand the past that led to it. And when new information presented itself, it either had to fit provably into the narrative to be considered true, or the narrative had to be adjusted to take account of new information that itself was provably true. In Herodotus' case, he was primarily trying to construct a narrative to explain why the Greeks and the Persians were so much at war with each other. Which sounds like as good a segue as any into our plans for April, in which we shall take a look at the history of Persia, and might just see if we can really count to 300. <laughs>
Thanks for listening to this episode of GM Word of the Week. We hope you're as excited as we are to dive into Persia next month. If nothing else, it will be fun and entertaining to listen to us fumble our way through the names. If you like what you've heard, why not join our patrons on Patreon and help support the show? A dollar gets you transcripts and early releases of episodes, and there are monthly chats and bonus episodes you haven't heard yet on offer for a modest amount more. It's our patrons who make this all possible, and for that we thank them very much. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Bran. Isn't this episode just an intro to next month? Casey. Music was provided as always, by Blue Dot Sessions. Progress, far from consisting in change, depends on retentiveness. When change is absolute, there remains no being to improve, and no direction is set for possible improvement. And when experience is not retained, as among savages, infancy is perpetual. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. George Santayana. <laughs>